Hello, residents of Douglas County. I am Commissioner Whitney Kenner Jones, your commissioner for District 2. I am very excited to be hosting the very first dual district dialogue uh, <laughs> today with Commissioner and Vice Chair Mark Alcaraz. You want to just talk a little bit about yourself briefly? Oh, no. Well, yeah, I've said a few of these. <laughs> hey, they know where I am, but I am so thankful for you to ask me to be a part of this. Well, I know um, that public health, public safety has been very important to you. That's something that the both of us have had the opportunity to bond over. And so I wanted to invite um, Lisa Crossman here today from the Public Health Department. Mm -hmm. I know you all are on the same committees and mm -hmm. just talk about what public health and public safety mean to you um, for Douglas County residents. So if you would introduce yourself, please. Thank you, I'm Lisa Crossman. I'm Deputy Director for Cobb and Douglas Public Health. Uh, thanks for having us here and letting me come and talk about public health. Uh, so you came to a commission meeting um, a few weeks a ago. A great commission meeting. I'm glad you're excited about it. I think that my buddy Commissioner Alcaraz, or Vice Chair Alcaraz, couldn't be there, but I know that he was very supportive of that initiative as well. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to be having some renovations to our public health department. So could you please explain kind of what that means for you all? Sure. So our public health department on Selman Drive was built in the mid 80s. Uh, and then it was renovated back in the mid-90s. And so that was the last time that it was expanded was 30 plus years ago, right? Um, and so we've done a few renovations, just paint and flooring, but nothing significant, particularly nothing for the footprint. And so as public health services have grown, as Douglas County population has grown, we are just busting at the seams. And so uh, the support that we got from the county commission, from county manager Corbin, from uh, prior commission chair Miller has just been phenomenal. We also got great support from our board of health members who also allocated some resources for us. And so we're excited that in 2025, we'll be able to expand that facility. Our goal is about adding about 10,000 square feet uh, we'll primarily be adding clinic rooms and some offices like counseling rooms and, and clinic space, uh, classroom. And then if it all works out together, I'd love to be able to add a Safe Kids Bay uh, where we can do car seat checks uh, out of the weather. Because right now our Safe Kids staff and our families are usually out in parking lots doing car seat checks and safety equipment checks. So, but we kind of have to wait and see. You know, we have a budget, we have a square footage. Uh, so right now we're just looking at is the site buildable and um, trying to get everything from our staff about what's needed. You all do car checks and that you're mm -hmm. trying to expand and I know one of the things that we discussed when we were in the commission meeting is my opinion um, and belief that the public health department is actually one of the first lines of defense in your town or community's mm -hmm. public health or public safety mm -hmm. committees. Um, talk a little bit about y'all's efforts to help make children in the county safe. So that's a really good point that we're one of, we often refer to it as we're one of the legs of the public safety stool, right? With police, fire, EMS, public health, we work very closely through our emergency preparedness and response division uh, with fire and police and EMS and the Emergency uh, Management Association. And so when you think about us helping folks stay safe, first of all, on a daily basis, right, our police and fire and EMS are doing that job. And um, on this 9-11, right, shout out to all of our public uh, safety folks um, for all that they do every day. With public health, we do a few things. So one is our Safe Kids program, where we work with families to help them how to keep their children safe in a car, on a bicycle, in their home, making sure that they understand safe sleep habits. Um, we also will work with our, um, our fire folks to do fire evacuation training with families so that when our nurses are in the home, we work with, okay, what would you do to keep your children safe in here? How would you get out in the case of an emergency? And so all of those things, I think, come together with our public safety folks, and we all reinforce what each other does. Well, I, I absolutely love that. Um, we're going to take a short break, and then when we come back, I do want to um, highlight you all's emergency responses and um, specifically the things that you all did um, with COVID-19 okay. and how you do that going forward. So we'll be right back. Okay, thank you. Thank you. 
So I know that the public health department has a wide array of services um, that they provide. Mm -hmm. One of the things I want to make sure that I commend you all on is your response to COVID-19. Um, with that, it makes me kind of think about the situation when we have school age kids or daycare age kids um, and vaccinations and things like that, mm -hmm. that parents may be able to get from the public health department that they may not be aware of. Mm -hmm. So could you talk a little bit about that? Sure, so thank you for the shout out on the COVID-19. That was certainly a, a team effort across the entire county with all businesses, all residents, the county government, everyone. So um, I'm glad we've emerged from that. It was a tough time for everyone, not just from a um, illness standpoint, a health standpoint, but an economic standpoint all across the board. So um, I'm pleased that we're moving forward. So one of our priorities in our maternal and child health area is providing adult and childhood vaccines. There are so many uh, preventable illnesses um, that are starting to reemerge because we have so many people that during the pandemic, they were not getting their um, scheduled vaccinations. Um, and so many times what we're seeing is an, a reemergence of these illnesses. So for example, we've had some re recent uptick in our pertussis illnesses, whooping cough. Mm -hmm. People may have referred to it as whooping cough early mm -hmm. on. And so pertussis is one that you would get vaccinated against with DTaP, your mm -hmm. DTaP vaccination. And what we're seeing is that many people who are my age um, had their DTaPs early on and they're starting to see a waning immunity to pertussis. And so where I might get it and just have a kind of a nagging cough. That seal sound. <laughs> yes, but it's not uh, something that I might be hospitalized or be terribly concerned about. But let's say I have a grandchild who is too young to be vaccinated with their Tdap vaccine. So then if I have whooping cough and I just think it's a bad cough, but then I'm interacting with my grandchild who's not yet fully vaccinated, that absolutely can put them at risk for very serious, uh, I mean, life-threatening illnesses. We're seeing the same thing with measles that many of our folks, because we're a global world, right, global now, that many of our unvaccinated folks are, we're seeing measles start to creep back up. And measles is tremendously um, infectious. And so we've had outbreaks in the region as well where somebody comes in from uh, traveling and they have measles, it passes across their family and then it passes potentially to other folks. So we really want to encourage residents to get their full vaccination schedule. Um, public health can provide all adult and childhood vaccinations. We also do international travel health vaccinations and malaria prophylaxis. So if folks are going to different countries, um, we can tell them what might be at risk, what they might be at risk at uh, for in those countries, and then what do they need to have in order to get back into the United States safely. Um, and would you agree people also need to pay attention to this um, in an emergency management context because if there's a natural disaster or something that make, may make our water systems infectious that you also want to have those um, protections as well? Yeah, so you know public health always is the focus, our focus is prevention. Mm -hmm. And so whether that is making sure that your child is in a car seat and is protected from a motor vehicle crash or whether you're getting a vaccine preventable uh, disease vaccination, all of those things make you more resilient and able to handle um, issues in a crisis. So whether that's a car crash or a tornado going through your community, anything that you can do from a prevention standpoint is gonna make you and your family more resilient. Um, speaking of prevention, do you all do anything with um, maternity care um, at the public health department? Can pregnant women come and use your services? Thank you for asking. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so a few things. One is I would tell you we're the USDA provider for our WIC program. So WIC is Women, Infant, and Children Nutrition Supplement Program. In our WIC program, we have thousands of pregnant women, breastfeeding women, and children under the age of five who have a nutritional deficiency come in, they can get um, nutritious food um, 
debit cards that would allow them to shop at their local grocery store for nutritious foods. And then we have registered dietitians that teach them about good nutrition. Uh, we have breastfeeding peer counselors and folks, and we even loan out breast pumps for folks who are going back to work. But all of that is to help our women have a healthier pregnancy and to help their young children thrive. In addition to that, our program offers case management services with nurses and social services folks. And so if I'm a pregnant woman in Douglas County, I can come into the health department and work with a nurse to make sure that number one, I get into good prenatal care. Uh, number two, that if I haven't had uh, my STD checks, I can get those because we're also concerned about congenital syphilis, which is syphilis that can pass from a mother to their baby at the time of birth. So we can get those, the woman tested and treated um, prior to delivery. Um, and then we have staff that just works really closely to make sure that that family has what they need for that baby when it comes home to thrive. That is absolutely amazing. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm so thankful that we have a resource like that in Douglas County. And I think you also, um, from time to time, partner with different agencies um, to do blood drives and things mm -hmm. like that. So could you tell the community a little bit about that? So our mission is with our partners to protect the health and safety of Cobb and Douglas residents, right? So that with our partners is key to our mission. We have 350 employees to serve about 900,000 residents across Douglas and Cobb County. And so there's no way we could do what we do without our partnership. So for example, we have a partnership with the new Douglas, uh, Wellstar Douglas Hospital uh, GME clinic that's just opening, that's providing primary care to the residents of Douglas County. And so we refer a lot of our, our families over to them if they need the primary care and don't have a resource for that. Um, you mentioned about the blood drive. I'm leaving here and going over to Truist Park uh, we're doing a big uh, blood drive with the Braves and Delta um, in honor of um, a young woman who passed away from cancer, uh, Morgan Delaney, and we're doing a, um, a blood drive in her honor. So every single day we do partnerships, whether it's with everybody in the Douglas County Government Group, um, Wellstar Hospital, Kaiser, um, all different groups across the county. That's Absolutely wonderful. Did you have anything you wanted to add? No, it's just a, <clears throat> one thing that is that I'm glad that you mentioned was safe sleep. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's about education of these young women to be, you know, to prevent child fatality, mm -hmm. which is the, <clears throat> to me, one of the most important. Uh, being with the coroner's office for a period of time, mm -hmm. one of the worst things I heard from a young mother was, I went in there and the child obviously had rolled over and mm -hmm. asphyxiated, but anyway, she said, I just didn't know. Mm -hmm. I didn't know. And she didn't take time to get the education. And it breaks your heart because I could see she was hurting so mm -hmm. bad. But she, you know, it's just if she would have had the material to read to know what she could and could or should not put in that crib, mm -hmm. that life could have could possibly still be here today. Uh, many times families don't have the resources to have a safe crib or a safe place for their child to sleep. And so you often think it's no harm to put my infant in with another child or in my bed mm -hmm. and that I'm gonna help keep that baby safe. But the reality is when we go to sleep, often we'll pull covers up yes. over that baby or we'll roll over unintentionally and that can cause suffocation. Um, and so we're trying to educate our, our Douglas residents and also provide them resources if they need that to keep the baby safe. Well, that is an absolute um, wonderful breadth of services that you <laughs> all provide. So if you could just quickly tell our residents exactly where and how to find you. Sure. So first I would say visit us on our Cobb and Douglas Public Health org website. Cobb and Douglas Public Health, all spelled out. Dot org website. We have about 30 distinct programs. You can find information on all of them, hours of operation. If you don't have access to that, you can always walk into our Selman Drive location. We're uh, located right beside the library um, and we're open Monday through Friday and folks can come in and see us there. Well, we want to, oh, don't want, don't want to tell my age, but <laughs> did I, you remember, come and get I remember services as a child that? coming to that facility. Did you? I did. And so, yes, it is Time. A, a, a renovation <laughs> is 
so needed. Not to uh, reflect on your age, but we do appreciate <laughs> their sorry, opportunity. I'm sorry, but the 80s is an excellent vintage. It may be time for some aesthetic enhancements, but we're still doing all right in the county. But Director Crossman, thank you sure. very much for coming. Thank you for having this me. Time with us. Okay. And we thank you so much. We'll see you soon. Okay, great. Well, welcome back, everybody. We have now been joined by Director Katrina Harley and Director James Queen. They are a powerhouse team of our first responders, and I thought it was so important that we have them here. I know we get lost sometimes in the public safety conversation with the Sheriff's Department, with the Police Department, with the Fire Department, but truly this team of individuals is our first set of first responders, so I'll give you a quick second to introduce yourself first, Director Harley, and then you, Director Queen, and tell the public what you do. Okay. Well, I am Katrina Harley. I am the Director of Douglas County E911. Um, my team services the county's um, emergency and non-emergency calls for service. Douglas County 911 uh, is the county's PSAP, and that's the Public Safety Answering Point. So that is the first line of entry anytime someone dials or texts 911. And about you, uh, Director Queen. Uh, my name's uh, James Queen. I'm the director of the Emergency Management Agency here in Douglas County. We maintain um, all of the emergency plans for the county, the hazard mitigation plan, as well as the emergency operations plans uh, for any major incidents that occur. And then we also coordinate the efforts among all of the responders for any of those disasters. That's wonderful. And so how about how long has Douglas County, I guess, had emergency management or is this new? Because I had not ever heard of them prior to doing this job and so. Most people haven't. Um, <laughs> a lot of older people will remember it as civil service. Oh, okay. We, it originally started as civil service back in the 50s and 60s. Um, in the 80s, it was changed into emergency management and our role kind of changed from defense to more of being prepared and mitigating for disasters. So how do you plan for the future? What do you see in terms of emergency management for Douglas County? As far as the future goes, there is a lot of potential as far as hazards that we do face, um, especially with the interstate being where it is, it bisects the county. Um, also with the railroad, there's always chances for hazardous materials incidents that occur there. So we spend a lot of time dealing with those. Um, thunderstorms are our biggest threat that we have. We see thunderstorm damage constantly here in the county. Uh, so we work with the National Weather Service to make sure that we're keeping up with all of the weather as far as that's concerned. Um, we also work closely with Greystone and Georgia Power keeping track of any power outages and trying to get information out to the residents so that they know what power restoration looks like. And you mentioned that you do um, emergency management planning with all of the larger agencies in Douglas County, but tell us a little bit about how families can prepare themselves for emergency situations. Um, preparing your family for an emergency situation is mainly making sure that you have food and water uh, for three days. We always tell everybody three days. Um, because in the event of a disaster, more than likely first responders are not going to be able to get to you for that first 72 hours. Um, just because of flooded roads, trees everywhere, all of those other types of hazards that are created through a disaster means that they have a slower response time. So you have to be able to take care of yourself for about 72 hours. And you need to be able to do that with your food, your water, your medications, as well as for your pets. Make sure that you have plenty of food for them. Make sure you have water for them. Um, because I know a lot of people, pets are their family. Mm -hmm. And I know that I am that way. So we always make sure that there's enough for the pets as well. Is there anything um, that families can do um, to make themselves easily identifiable or um, to assist them in having themselves rescued when first responders can get to them? You can always put out some kind of a marker on the outside of your home. Uh, we actually have a program called uh, CERT. It's the Community Emergency Response Team. We just finished up with a class with the uh, 10 individuals for that. And they are trained in doing basic search and rescue, basic first aid, basic firefighting, and being able to assist their neighborhoods as the start. So we try to encourage people to join groups like that so that they're able to help in their community. 
Um, it's always your family first, your safety first, and then look after the rest of your community. And we try to make sure that we have people that are able to get out there and do that. That's awesome. We're going to take a quick break, and then when we come back, we're going to hear more about E911 from Director Harley. Welcome back. We are here with Director Katrina Harley um, to tell us more about what you do with E911. Yes, so we answer all emergency and non-emergency calls for service uh, in Douglas County. Last year, we fielded about 226,000 calls for service uh, in our 911 center. And that's pretty much where we are on track to actually exceed this year. Oh, wow. That's a lot of calls, double the number of residents that we have. And so you would not know that y'all are processing that volume. So what are you doing, I guess, from a self-help perspective to make sure that your staff doesn't get burnt out with that volume? So the average burnout rate, and it's interesting that you asked that question, the average burnout rate for uh, 911 operators nationally is about two years. And so it's important for us to just uh, do check-ins and we also uh, partner with some community agencies that come in and bring uh, grounding activities, coloring books and things, just so that when our operators, um, when they do have a little lull, that they can do some things that take their minds off of the 911 calls themselves. Um, and that's very important because uh, what happens a lot of times is there's no emotional recovery when it comes to uh, being a 911 operator. Uh, and what I mean by that is, you know, once they handle and process one emergency, they're on to the next emergency. And they don't know what was the end of, of the call that they just uh, got off of. One of the things that I like to say is it's like reading a book. You have a beginning, you have a middle, you have the end. Well, 911 is the beginning. And so a lot of times they don't see the middle or the end. And so with that, there's no emotional recovery. And so it's very important to check in with your staff. And so we ensure that our supervisors are doing that and that my deputy director, who is actually over operations, that she checks in and that we take care of the people that take care of the people. So you and Director Queen um, both kind of discuss that you guys are always going to be there to respond, that you're going to make sure that you have um, redundancies in place and things like that. And I hear a rumor that E911 may be getting an additional facility. So could you tell the public about that? Absolutely. So we uh, have currently been approved, and thank you all, uh, our Board of Commissioners. <laughs> you like that? Uh, we, well, we, we have been uh, approved uh, to start a design bill for a backup 911 center. And that's very important for the community because you need that emergency redundancy if something should happen and your primary site goes down. We also serve as the backup center for sheriff dispatch. And so if the primary 911 center goes down, we have to have somewhere for all of our emergency services to be dispatched so that we can ensure that we are taking care of our citizens and visitors to Douglas County. And is that going to be on the same site that you're currently on, or is that going to be in a secondary location? Absolutely not. It will be, <laughs> in, a, it will be in a secondary location. And that will help, I assume, if one location goes down, the hope is that the secondary location would be able to pick up that call volume and still be able to make sure that our residents are safe? Yes, and so that should be a seamless transition for our residents. A lot of times when, when we do have those type emergencies, and Director Queen can attest to this, it's very seamless to the public. Now, there's a lot going on on the back end, but we, we try to make that as seamless as possible to the public. The public should always feel safe and secure in their ability to call 911 if needed. I love that. Did you have any questions, Commissioner? Yeah. <clears throat> Just, I was recently in a class, um, one of our commissioner training classes, and it was emergency preparedness and response. And you wouldn't believe the amount of commissioners, they asked the question, how many of you know who you're EMA director is. <clears throat> wow. There was only a couple of us in the class that knew who our director was, and which was eye-opening to me. And the discussion went on in regards to some of our commissioners from South Georgia were there when the hurricane came through, and how they weren't, some of them were not prepared. <clears throat> and so, you know, hearing that, how does, uh, I, I know we know, but tell our public a little bit about a couple of things. One, 
our importance in regards to what you and I discussed in regards to, is, is it NIMS correct? Did I get that That's right? Correct. That's coming up. Our role that we're going to play in, if we have another disaster in our county. And not only that, the alert service that you recently came to us about. I know that there's some that, you know, we have the sign up, but also there's the one that just overrides that if you're within our county, mm -hmm. you will mm -hmm. get this alert. If you Correct. could just speak on that for a moment. So you want me to handle cold red first? Sure. Okay. So uh, we have uh, cold red and that is a, a mass emergency notification system. And that's the one that uh, folks, residents sign up for and they can go to the county website and sign up for that. It is free of charge. Um, and they select how they want to be notified. So via email, via text message, via phone call, uh, Code Red does weather alerting. It also alerts for um, missing children or just uh, anything like that. And so Director Queen will tap on the, the addition to, uh, to that service. The, the other part that you were speaking about is um, iPaws. Um, and it is the uh, way that we get child abduction alerts, we get the um, national weather alerts. It's the emergency, it ties into the emergency alert system that is the presidential system. And it allows us to send out a message to any cell phone, um, any TV, any radio, what that emergency alert is. Uh, all through, it ties into the code red system. It's an additional port that we put onto that. Um, we have to go through a licensing process to get certified to do iPaws messaging, um, which we have just completed. So we're getting ready to tack on the part to Code Red so that we can start issuing those emergency messages. Good. Um, as far as the NIMS is concerned, that's the incident management system that is required by federal law that every community use. Um, and it's a way of managing emergencies. It can be made as big or as small as we need it to be. Um, as far as the county commissioner's part that will be played in that, they actually have, there's a four hour training class for the commissioners where you will learn how to work within an emergency operations center. Um, you learn more about how the emergency operations center should run, what the different positions are that are in there, and how your interactions will help with making decisions. That is absolutely wonderful. Well, the last question that I have for you all, um, so most of our residents have some form of a smartphone or technology, but for those who don't have a smartphone, does that code red um, or that messaging system still work for those phones? Yes, yes, it does. And how do they get those alerts so that those residents know what to look for? Those alerts will come out um, it's going to be the same as if they get any other emergency alert for a missing child, for an Amber Alert or a Levi's call or anything like that. It will say that it's from Douglas County Emergency Management. And for the phones that aren't smartphones, we're limited to 92 characters. So it's going to be short and sweet and to the point. <laughs> it, it's going to tell you what it is, what you need to do. And that's pretty much going to be the extent of what they will get. Um, it won't have quite the detail that the smartphones get. Um, we're allowed 360 characters on the smartphones that we can send out, so. And as for E911, uh, just to note that cell phones will still dial 911 even if there is no service. Um, that actually makes me have an additional question. So I know most people are moving around, they have a smartphone, um, but they may not have a landline phone anymore. So is there anything that individuals who may be calling 911 from a, a cell phone may need to do to help you all respond to them better? Yes, it's important to know your location. Uh, one of the things that I always say is if you're driving down the road, look at the cross streets, you know, look at the businesses and things, but knowing your location is paramount to getting the fastest service possible. Well, that has been absolutely wonderful. Um, I'm so thankful that you all came and spent this time with me and Vice Chair um, Alcarez to teach Douglas County residents about what we have to offer from a public health and a public safety standpoint. Um, we hope that you enjoyed this information and we look forward to having the opportunity to dialogue with you all again in the future. Thanks for coming by. Thank you for Thank having you. us. Thank you very much.